Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm here with Charlotte Babb. She's a former English teacher, a fairy, an artist, and a fiction author. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So you said that you were an English teacher for 40 years, and now you get to play. So can you tell us a little bit more about your background as a landscape photographer and painter? We have a wall well, painting and drawing and, you know, since I could hold a pencil, basically. So, but we have a local garden here, Hatcher Garden in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which if anybody wants to come to Spartanburg, you need to go to Hatcher Garden. It's beautiful. It's about 10 acres of woodland and it's not a formal garden. It's very much like walking through the woods, except they have, have paths and you know, benches you can sit on and lots and lots of flowers and turtles. I like turtles. So I would go over there to walk and I'd take my camera and I would take pictures of whatever I saw that I liked that day. And then with the idea that I would use those to do watercolors. A friend of mine and I decided to start meeting on Friday mornings about just about six years ago, I think, and just sit. We go to our local Barnes & Noble and pull some tables together and sit and paint watercolor just for fun. And I would use those pictures that I had taken as reference pictures. You know, so I tend to paint. I like flowers. I like bugs. I like you know, butterflies and dragonflies. And I like lizards and turtles. And, you know, I don't want to play with them, but they're fun to paint. So I would take my pictures and then I would paint them and we'd compare. And then next week we'd do it again. And we've been doing this about, like I said, about six years now. He moved to California. So that's, he's not there, but we've collected some other people. They've come and paint with us. So. And it's not a class. We just all sit around and paint and talk and, you know, smear paint and, and make pictures and have fun. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm all about. This it is literally playtime for me. My writing, I could not do while I was grading papers. It took all my, <laughs> it sucked every bit of juice out of me. Oh. For hours and hours. Yeah. I, <laughs> when you, have, you know, four or five classes that you've got 30 people in it. And they're all writing essays. You've got to grade them. So, you know, but I retired several years ago and I'm now 72. So if you think it's too late for you, it is not. I love uh, that so much. And so, like I said, I've, I've, and I use a point and shoot camera. It's got a nice zoom on it. It's a, a Kodak. I don't remember what kind, you know, it was on Woot one day and it was purple and it was a reasonable price. So I bought it and I've been playing with it ever since. It's digital. The only problem I have with it as a camera is that it, it can't figure out what I'm looking at sometimes. And it takes it a long time to decide what I'm looking at and then to focus on it. So that, you know, if some hawk comes flying by, there's no chance for me to take a picture of that. But I have, if it sits on a branch for a while and looks at me and like, what the hell are you doing? Then it, you know, then I'll sit there long enough. I can take a picture of it. So, and that's kind of what I do is I take pictures of things that I like, you know, and, and all mostly in this 10 acre garden. So I have, oh, nice. I had about, let's see, I think I started doing that in 2014. So that's almost 10 years of pictures of turtles, flowers, and the water and the, you know, occasionally a duck will come through. I've seen a heron there once or twice. Several years ago, we had a really cold spell. It was under 20 degrees here for almost a week, which never happens. Never, never, never. And there was like an inch of ice. Well, I went a couple of days after, and some of the ice had broken, but there's like this, this shelf of one inch thick ice around the edge of the pond. There's several ponds, and this one had that much. It had broken, you know, broken off and fallen in. And I didn't stay there long because it was still 20 degrees, you know, but which for here in South Carolina is very cold. But I took some pictures of that just because I'd never seen that before. And let's say flowers, turtles, you know, bugs, snakes occasionally. I went by this bush one day and above a direction, man, my well, intuition, whatever, said, you hey, take a picture of that bush. It's like, I want to take a picture. Take a picture of the bush. Okay, okay, I'll take a picture of the bush. When I got home and looked at the pictures big on the screen, there was a snake in the bush. And oh, I was looking I... at it like, take my picture, I'm beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get, you get home and look at them, say. Well, yeah. your painting sounds so relaxing. Oh, yeah. 
So how do you, I mean, can you walk us through your creative process? Do you just take a walk through your 10 acres and how do you select the photographs that you want to make a painting out of? And, and part of the idea was walking is boring. We have a, what they call the rail trail here. It used to be a railroad track. So it's, you know, fairly level and all. And people walk up and down. It's like, there's nothing there except other people. And I don't want to take pictures of people. So, yeah, they just walk and they walk and they walk and they walk. Well, this is like, you walk around a little bit, you take a picture. Walk a little bit, take another little picture. A little bit, you know. And so you're, you're getting some exercise, but it's not, whoa, 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 I'm walking. It's like, oh, there's something. Let's take a picture of that. So it makes it a lot more fun. And it is relaxing. And this is right on, uh, it's, it's on a four lane hop. No, it's fairly busy and, and it's in town. I mean, Spartanburg's not that big of a town, but still, but it's very quiet because of all the trees. So you feel like even there's 20 or 30 people in this garden, it's still quiet unless there's a whole bunch of kids, in which case, you know, kids make shrieking noises and you can hear them, but you get a sense of being by yourself and having some solitude and silence. Which is very good for your mental health. Yeah, so I was just going to say, we all need that. I think we're all meant to spend spend more time outside. I definitely agree. And they have a, they have a, a, a pond up at the top level, and it goes to another pond that's a blackwater swamp with cypress trees. And they actually have carp, goldfish about so big that you can sometimes see. And that makes a little waterfall and it goes down to another little pond. And then that goes down another waterfall to a bigger pond. And then they pump the water from the big pond back up to the <laughs> top and let it come back around. So unless there's something wrong with the pump, which occasionally happens, they've been doing this for years and years and years. Yeah, they can turn the waterfall on and off. But you go there and you've got this nice water sound going on and the wind and the trees and whatever birds are around and squirrels and, you know, it's a park. It's like being in the woods, but cleaned up. Yeah. So at least you're not out there walking around with, with worrying about weeds and poison ivy and things like that. Well, no. how do you, I mean, how would, how would you describe your, your personal style? I mean, would you say this? I mean, we're saying that so you're, you fo focus mainly on like botanicals and, you know, animals and things of that nature. I pick things that make me happy. Now, you know, sometimes when I, there is something else I like to paint, I do, I work with a company called Artemat. They take old cigarette machines. You know, you're not old enough to remember cigarette machines. I am actually. <laughs> you know, this guy refurbishes them and makes them look pretty and all this stuff. And then people like me make art the size of a cigarette pack, you know, basically two inches by three inches. And so one of the things that I paint is old rusty cars. I just find pictures of them wherever I can find them, and I call them clunkers. And so I paint those because, again, I love that. It, that makes me happy. And I paint turtles, and I've actually got a, a series of these. A lot of the stuff I do in acrylic, I have a series of North Carolina lighthouses because our Artemat is based in Winston Salem, North Carolina. So they have a lot of venues in North Carolina. It makes sense to do North Carolina lighthouses, but I also do Star Wars and movies and. Just whatever, you know, I've also, you're not limited to one genre. You sounds like you kind of, you're very well-rounded. In fact, I've been experimenting with this new UV resin and I figured out how to take a, a stamp of a metal butterfly. That's just the outline of the wings and put resin in that and color it and makes it look like a stained glass butterfly. Oh, neat. So you, you mentioned that you use acrylic and what did you call it? UV resin? Acrylic and UV resin and cardboard and whatever else comes to mind. I have made jewelry and, you know, like I said, I'm playing. I'm literally making up for not getting to play all these years. It's my turn. I'm going to have fun. And that's very much my process. I chose to do watercolor because it doesn't require as much space as acrylic does to me. And it, it's, it dries and I get doing oil. One, it smells bad, and two, and three, it takes forever to dry, where I could do a watercolor yeah. painting in a couple of hours. You know, small, eight by ten. So, you know, we get that to makes sense. At like, like I never thought about. 
nine o'clock in the morning and we get a cup of coffee and a bagel. And we sit down and either we've already decided what we're going to paint or we go look for a picture and draw it out, sketch it. And by 11, 11.30, I've got a painting. So, you know, it just, it's just very simple. That's a good size. It's big enough to have detail, but small enough that you can finish it. So, and sometimes they turn out and I just love them. And sometimes they don't. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's art. It's like photographs. And yeah, that's true. Hey, oh. go ahead. Yeah. Are there any messages or emotions that you, that you like to convey through your work or it's just all about, you know, just having fun or do you feel a particular way when you work on a piece? I would like for people to feel relaxed and happy and just to look at my picture and go, oh, you know, just kind of, you know, just relax. I did do a painting. Back in, was it 2016? Yes. What year is it? Uh, there was a tornado came through and dropped a tree on my house. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't pick me up and take me away like Dorothy, but I was in the house at the time. That's scary. <laughs> I, I was terrified. And I drew a picture of where the, the tree had fallen and broken through the roof of my house in my living room. And the, the rafters were all been there and there was all this insulation and stuff. And I called it Still Life with Rafters and took it to the county and got a, an award as a professional artist because I, I figured, what the hell, I have gotten paid once or twice. And they gave me the award that year for Still Life with Rafters. It was the painting of my living room being crashed by a tree. And thank goodness they got all of that cleaned up and it's all, you know, over and done with, I don't have to worry about that tree anymore because that tree's not in my yard anymore. I have some others. And, well, I can yeah. imagine it was probably very cathartic to to paint something like that, I would think. I, I found that the best way to deal with that whole process, which was, I mean, I had I was out of my house for almost a year from October to June. I stayed at a hotel for a while and I lived in a, an apartment for a while, which the apartment I lived in had a creek behind there and there were lots of turtles. So that was good. And I had bird feeders so I could see birds. And I actually saw a couple of beavers. They had a a beaver's mound in the, in the creek. And one time we had a flood, it, it didn't come up on the land, but the, the creek was flooded enough so that the beavers left their lodge. So I actually got to see real live beavers, you know, I've never seen that before. But at any rate, my way of dealing with all of that was to kind of make fun of it. I mean, when I, when it first happened, I posted on Facebook that I now have a new water feature in my house. It was water coming in from the rain, but you know, if you can, if you can approach things from a certain amount of silliness, it makes life so much better because, you know, you laugh at it. And so I try to do that. Yeah, I think it, it reminds me of that saying, if you don't laugh, you'll cry type thing. You have to, we have to have a certain amount of humor, I think, to Laughing beats get crying. through life. Even with our little kerfluffle with the computer this morning, it's better if you can laugh at it. There's no point in raising your blood pressure because, you know, <laughs> the miscommunication or whatever, or waiting on the thing to download or, you know, the more snark you can put in it the happier you are let's face it being happy is important that's true life is so short as it is and you don't really want i don't i feel like it's such a waste of energy and a waste of being here if we're miserable all the time mm -hmm. and you know with a negative outlook so i really feel like art does help us it helps our emotions that helps our emotional state making art is not only good for us but i think the you know if you can make that viewer have an emotional connection to your work as well it can be healing on the opposite side too one of the things that i'm doing with the paintings is trying to improve my technique i mean you know like any art you never master photography you never master watercolors you never master drawing you just get better at it oh you have a kitty Oh, yeah, this is Butterscotch. <laughs> he likes to come in and say hi. He's a ladies' man. Yeah. 
He's a pretty boy. Yes, he is. He says, all right, I've interrupted things now. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's done his job. His work is done. <laughs> but uh, like I said, just to try, to try to learn how to do something new that I haven't done before. You know, one of the things that kind of bugs me, people will say, oh, you have so much talent. It's like, no, I'm developing my skills. I mean, there's some talent there, but a talented person with no skills is no better off than a person with no talent. Correct. Yeah. You know, so anything that you work out of I me, mean, the pictures I was taking back in 2014 are not nearly as good as the ones I take now because I've gotten better at looking at stuff and, and pointing my camera in the right direction and, you know. They're just better, although I'm still me and it's still the same. You know, I took these pictures last year too, but they look better. I've, I've gotten better at the right time and the right lighting. Same thing with my art. I do better compositions. Biggest problem I have with some of that is sometimes the picture I have, I like the composition, but the colors are dull. Like maybe I took it on a cloudy day. And unfortunately, I tend to paint it like I see it instead of making it more like I would like for it to look. So I'm still working with that. Okay, because I was going to ask if you had con if you were going to continue if you saw yourself continuing to take the photos and painting from them. So it sounds like you also maybe want to learn a little bit of photo retouching, or you know you could just as an idea if it were important enough to you, you could probably ask someone to retouch the photo for you, make the colors more more vibrant. I could pull them in. I, I... Photoshop is my third favorite thing to play with, so I could pull it in and, and just, I just don't usually do that, but I could. Yeah, it was something that I just could not figure out how to change it myself, just looking at it, then I could pull it into Photoshop. And I have done that to, you know, crap out stuff that I didn't like or to focus in on something and, and, you know, make it bigger so I could see it better. So, you know, it's just a matter of how much do you want to play with it? Yeah, true. And I always say, like, there's a certain point where you can overwork something, too. You can overwork it to death and <laughs> end up with something entirely different than what you intended, which isn't always a good thing. Yeah, I'm on a watercolor forum on Facebook, and, and they were saying, you know, what is your advice for a beginning painter? And mine is, don't stop when you're two-thirds of the way through, and don't say that it's ruined. If nothing else, let it get dry. Walk away from it for a day or two and see what you actually have. Because you get so involved in smearing paint that you can't really see the picture anymore. And there's been a lot of things that I was like, oh, I hate this. But next week when I went back and looked at it, because I had pulled it out of my little paint kit that I have to take to Barnes & Noble, it looked pretty good, you know, but it just didn't look good before it got dry. Yeah, I can kind of relate to that because when I'm retouching photos, sometimes you have you stare at the photo, you know, you're staring at it so long that you're not sure if, you know, I do have to put it away and come back to it later and just take a break and walk away. So I, I can totally relate to what you're saying there. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. And you said something about style. I think everybody's style comes out of who they are and how they move their hands. And it's very, very organic. I mean, I guess you could try to paint like Frank Pozzetta if you wanted to. You're not going to make it, but, you know, you can try. Or you could try to be Georgia O'Keefe, or you could try to be Ansel Adams or whoever. But I think your style comes out of who you are. Well said. I mean, I can remember. I took an art class for elementary school teachers back when I was in college. I had played around with the idea of maybe I wanted to be a teacher. Well, I didn't want to be a teacher, but I thought it would be a good job. You shouldn't take advice from a 14 year old, especially if it's you. <laughs> but at any rate, I took this class and I realized that my drawings, you could tell they were mine, even if we all drew the same thing, because at that point I had a style, if you want to call it that, just the way that I draw. And every, another class I took, I was showing this girl some little, I had taken some clay and made some little my relief animals again for Artemat. And she says, Yeah, I can see the way that you draw, even in the way you make these animals, because they were like 3D drawings, you know. And it just, and it used to really bother me. My style tends to be cute. And I thought, you know, cute is not such a bad thing to be. <laughs> so, you know, okay, I embrace okay. my inner cuteness. Yeah. So, and I'm sure, you know, your style's probably evolved a little bit over time, but 
going back to what you said about like, you all have the same subject, but everybody's work look different. And I always say the same thing about photographers. We can, you know, you can put a bunch of us in the room with the same subject, but all of our photos are going to look different because we all have different approaches. And you're more interested in different parts of the composition. Yeah. That's the other thing that most photographers and artists have to work on is one, being able to see what's there. You know, it's not just a, bu a bucket of apples. There's got to be something about that bucket of apples that attracts you. If it's the stripes on the apples or the water drops on the bucket or the shadows from the sunshine, something. And the other part is having enough skill to capture what you see. And I know most of the people I know that have trouble with watercolor, it's not watercolor. They can't draw. So I tell them, you know, trace the picture and then work on your watercolor. You know, you eventually have to, you know, and that's the same thing. I mean, with photography, you kind of have to work with what you've got, but you can also work with your own, with the lighting somewhat, depending on how much equipment you want to carry around with you. Pictures that I take at Hatcher. My flash doesn't go far enough to take the pictures because if I'm going to take a, a macro shot of a, of a flower, I have to be eight feet away from it for my camera to zoom into it. So, you know, having a flash does not help that at all. It, just, <laughs> it fades out before it gets to the flower. So uh, it makes a real difference whether I'm under the trees or, in fact, I have my camera set candlelight, I think, most of the time. It doesn't have a very high ISO setting and it, it, it has like, sunny portrait night you know <laughs> can't actually set the camera because it's you know intended for idiots and you know, i've never learned how to do all that so i've wondered if i could get one that's a little bit smarter than my camera that i can figure out how just to do the focus myself and let it figure out the rest of it so i don't know if such a camera exists and like i said so far i hadn't gotten off the hip to get another camera anyway so well, photography does take does take time to learn, and it is its own art form. I am curious. I think I wonder how your work would change quite a bit, or if it would change a lot if you learned how to shoot manual on your camera. Just speaking to you as a photographer, I think it would change quite a bit. But what you said about paying attention to what you see in front of you, I do think as artists, it makes you more observant. You know, I've, I've noticed when I did pick up my camera to learn photography, you start to pay attention to the little details. Um, and those are the things that we, we, we see and what, what we attempt to capture. So, and I also liked your other tip about, you know, just doing something and, you know, sometimes you don't always have to finish it in one go. You know, it's okay to walk away from it and come back later. Um, but I also really appreciated what you said about like, the watercolor is not taking as long to dry and, you know, maybe doing it as an eight by 10, because if you are looking to create a lot of work, or especially if you've got somebody who's got an upcoming art show, <laughs> you know, so I would say size matters. <laughs> well, and, and the yeah. other thing of that is if you're going to enter a picture into the, even the county fair, you're going to do, or the library show or whatever, you know, local things, you're going to do better if you do an 18 by 24. People like big pictures better than little ones. I have seen occasionally to a show where a small picture got an award, but most of the time they're big because it's harder to paint a big picture. It's harder to take a photograph that you can blow up to poster size, you know, there other than have a. I always say larger images have more visual impact. Like you said, you can see more detail in them, but I do find also, I've also had somebody who tells me she does a lot of small paintings that she feels like people don't have as much wall space. So she sells a lot of small prints. But I also think you're going to sell what you show. So you show what you're not going yeah. to <laughs> You got to put it out there. So it's it's just interesting to see the two different, I don't know, thought processes behind it. And I, I'm curious myself, you know, still trying to figure out what size tends to sell the best. But like you said, if you're entering it and you're looking just for an award or it's a competition, you know, I, I can see where larger definitely is better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I don't like the sales aspect of stuff. And part of what I went into the watercolor for was just 
to do something just for fun. The Artemat stuff I do, I like because I send it to them and they do the marketing and the shipping and collecting the money and then they send me a check, which is the best part. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, you know. You don't have to deal with any of the shipping and worrying about it getting damaged. They handle all the sales. Yeah, well, it allows it to, you up to, to create. I do have to ship it to them. Oh, do you? Yeah. They, you know, and apparently people like what I make. So, because it, you know, they keep telling me they sell out. So, that's a good thing. And I get to do the part that I like to do. So, and I have done some things with some, I had pictures of birds that I took. I had a, during COVID, I had my camera set up on my desk so I could take pictures of birds at my bird feeder. So I had, you know, pictures of birds. And so I made a series of, of those. And I had some pictures from Hastur that had, I called it buds and bugs. they flowers with bugs on them, you know, bees and butterflies and, and dragonflies. And you know, people like bumblebees. They're cute. So I did some of those. Photography doesn't sell as well at Artemat as as other things do for some reason. I don't know. I think I've seen that. I think people who don't, really understand photography, the art of it, think, well, anybody can point and shoot a camera, you know? Well, yeah, but that's not necessarily art. I know a lot of the pictures I've taken have not been art. They've just been <laughs> images. So, well, people may not view it as art, but there is an art to it. That's why people pay professionals. And I definitely think that, you know, it's, people may not see it as art, but there, I don't know how to describe it, but I understand what you're saying about people maybe not buying landscape photography prints versus painted. I'm thinking painted. Probably there's the perception that there is more skill involved, um, but it's taken me years to learn my craft. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I belong to the Tampa Bay Society of Museum of Photographic Arts. And, you know, it is one thing that is an observation that I've noticed. People tend to devalue photography because they don't view it as an actual art, but there's, it's always more, it's always more than clicking a button. As I said, if people could go out and take that same photo themselves, they would. <laughs> well, and you know, if you look at, well, just looking at the pictures people put on Facebook, most of them are, okay. And they're, and then what they're interested in is here's a picture of me and my significant other or my kids or my hell my chicken you know but they're the if photographs are not interesting they they like the seven it's just like paintings i found that people respond to the subject matter of the painting they can't tell whether it's painted well or not they either like what's a picture of or they don't you know somebody doesn't like turtles they're not going to like my turtle pic but if they have a picture of a cat they're going to like it because it's a cat that's true. Whether it's painted well. Now, I've seen pictures of cats that were exquisite. And I, when I just dream of being able to create that image of that cat because it's so beautiful and so beautifully done. And same thing with, you know, photographs. Yeah. Right place, right time, right equipment, and knowing what to do with it. And that's a whole lot more than standing in front of it and pushing a button. As you know. That's right. So, um, and people who don't know that don't know that. And that's kind of like, no, I'm not going to tell you that story. Never mind. You erase that. But anyway, what do people like in book covers? Because one of the things that I've used Photoshop for is to make my book covers. And I've actually made book covers for other people, not very often, but occasionally. And either using their artwork or artwork somebody else has made or collaging stock photos together or whatever, you know, we made it a day. I wanted to at least touch on your, your books. I probably should have, I feel like I missed a whole conversation there because I see you have your books all over Amazon. What inspired you to write the books? You talk about being a fairy godmother, like, is that present in all of your books? I have two novels. And three short story collections about Maven, my fairy godmother, who looks an awful lot like me. I've always wanted to write, and like I said, I couldn't. It's been it's been a, a balance, you know. Do I spend my time doing art, which takes time? Do I spend my time doing writing, which takes time? You know, back and forth. And I finally, now that we have Amazon Bella, I can. I wrote an episode this morning, which I will 
release later today. And this afternoon, I'll work on my Artemat stuff. So that's been it. But I've wanted to write ever since I read Little Women when I was nine years old. And Joe Mark was a writer. And I thought, oh, I want to do that. I want to tell stories. And it's taken me a very long time to, you know, that's that's a craft too. You know, it really, really it is. is. But you did it. And the important thing is, is you're doing it, you know, better, better late than never. <laughs> I, uh, I've always liked fairy tales. In fact, my favorite cartoon was Fractured Fairy Tales from Rocky and Bullwinkle. I don't know if you know what that is or not. but yes, uh, I remember Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> and I remember thinking, watching this, that does the government know what they're showing us? Because I was paranoid even back then. <laughs> it was like, they're so snarky. I love that show. But anyway, Fractured Fairy Tales. And. It occurred to me one day when I was teaching, I, I used to teach English and I would teach, you know, 101, which is this class everybody has to take to learn how to write essays. And it occurred to me that I had a whole bunch of frogs in front of me and they all needed to be princes and princesses. And I was their fairy godmother trying to show them how to do that so that, you know, they could write and make good grades on the rest of their papers when they learn how to write essays. And I thought, well, being the fairy godmother would be more fun than <laughs> And of course, my fairy godmother gets into all kinds of trouble because she wants the ugly sisters to have wishes too. Not that that has actually turned out in a story yet, but like I said, I've got, I wrote that first novel, it took me about 20 years to write. The second one, about five, partly because I was going to be teaching at a writing conference and I was going to teach about steampunk. And so I needed to finish my steampunk book to have it to sell, which I did. Right. Yep. I mean, you know, it, it, all of these things, they all work together in my mind. My style of writing, my style of painting, what I take pictures of, the style of that, it's all me, you know, and I can't, if I wanted to hide that, I can't. It comes through anyway, you know, and so that's why I say the, the, you, your style develops as you develop as a person. And I suppose you can artificially, you know, put this style on top of that. I mean, I'm, I am writing a, a mystery with a friend of mine whose writing style is very different from mine. And I kind of have to pretend to be her when I'm writing my episodes to write the way that she does. For one thing, she likes to write in first person and I don't. And she's she's extremely energetic and all this kind of stuff. I'm kind of more laid back than that. So it's, it's been kind of interesting to to get into her voice to keep the style of the story going but like i said it all comes out of the back of your head anyway so it's going to be look yeah. like well i thank you so much for joining us today and i will post the links to your work on amazon so people can take a look at your your books and your artwork and hopefully you make some sales and i look forward to seeing more from you well thank you very much and uh, this has been very fun i've enjoyed it a lot